Okay, I have to take care for two minutes. So, all right. So, welcome. Thanks for coming to um, advanced opposition strategy, and this is really going to focus on the strategy that one needs when you're opposition, because uh, there seems to be a bit of a uh, misnomer. Hi, welcome. Welcome. Yeah, come on in. We just started, so. Um, the uh, the thing about it is most people tend to think when you're in opposition, it's kind of nice because there's really not a lot to do. You kind of kick around a few arguments. Well, they might say this, they might say that. Here's a couple things we might say, okay, cool, let's go have a cigarette or a coffee, or hang out, and whatever, right? Uh, this kind of thing. And it's sort of a very uh, bad idea. If you debate for a while, you kind of get the sense that opposition is the worst position to hold because you have to do a lot more work. And that's what I refer to when I talk about strategy. So. Before we start, before I start actually talking, right, right, uh, I would like to get from you some ideas as to what are the things that you have problems with when you are opposition, either in general or specific to a subject. Right? Let's see if we can go around, think about it for a minute. I'll go around and ask each of you uh, to name something that you have some difficulty with. Yeah, well, if you're the way. Like summing up the whole thing in seven minutes and try to pick the most important things. Well, you know, maybe your criteria is not the same as the judge. Right. Maybe your criteria is not the same as the, how do you do a whip yeah. speech, right? Okay. Very good. It's a huge problem, right? Because that cuts to not only your material component requirement but role fulfillment, right? And you can so easily, in a very simple way, go to the bottom if you don't know. What other things? Yes. Uh, while playing in Ukraine, we may concentrate on uh, rebutting the model, mm -hmm. like too too detailed, too detailizing it, mm -hmm. and trying to rebut it and saying that you have no mechanism, no this, no that. And it's I don't think it's not very essential to mm -hmm. rebut the model. Okay, so uh, what would be your um, issue or your concern with being opposition? Would you say what's difficult for you? Uh, not to focus only on model. Okay. Not to focus only on one argument? Model. The model. Oh, one yeah. thing. Okay, very good. What other things? Who else has one? I think that the most difficult role is the first speaker of the second position because he needs to try to attached to the extension he heard a moment ago from the first part of the second government, then to make a new extension. So first rebuttal and analyzing the extension of the opponent, and then your new extension. So I think it is the whole debate, the most difficult role. Yeah, I think there's a pretty good case that that's the most difficult position. Right? Everyone is one thing to think about is who has the most difficult job. And if you have a, you have a good model of debate, I think, when there's a good argument you can make for any speaker. <laughs> right? I think that's what we have, but yeah, it's very difficult. Very hard to do. We'll talk about that. Not having enough time to present your own material. Not, not having enough time to present your own what? Material. Your own substantive. Yeah, your own sub substantive stuff, your own matter. So issues of time, original matter. Yeah. Uh, if you are the first speaker of well, first opposite, uh, you can know uh, in which way will the debate go. Mm -hmm. And if you do your plan, uh, it will be, uh, it, uh, you, you, you maybe have to change it. Mm -hmm. because the, yeah. And remove it completely. Yeah, first opposition. You could spend all your time working on one argument that you think is great, and then the government does something totally mm -hmm. different. And you're like, what do I do now? Right? You have one? I wanted to say something like that also when you prepare the whole case, and I, it happened so many times for me. Not, not like you have the opposition team that prepares the whole case, yeah. and then you have the government that says something completely different. How, how are you going to prepare it for, yeah. for, for, for those kinds of things? Right, right, exactly. Well, I, I have some good news. I think that although I might not be able to answer all these things, I do think that today we'll make some headway in dealing with most all these things. Right? Did you have one update? I'm trying to understand what your role is in this last speech. Oh, yeah. In the last speech? Well, uh, the, both of the second uh, and 
the second crop, like understanding your role. I'm still learning that, which is right. really confusing. We'll talk about that too. Second opposition role. Yeah. I mean, what what is that? Right. Okay, so I have divided today's talk into three different areas of analysis to think about. Right. Three different things. There's prep, 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 and the debate. Okay, so there's three different areas we're going to look at. Prep, 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 and the debate. Right? And then I'll talk a little bit at the end about second opposition and web stuff. So, things that you need to do to have a good opposition strategy are incredibly difficult. I remember when I was a college debater uh, doing parliamentary debate in PDA, which is sort of West, Western United States Organization of American Parley, uh, we found opposition to be the most fun, but you have to work at it the most. And as a debater, we got this invitation at my university uh, to come and hear Brian Mulroney speak, who was the former Prime Minister of Canada. And this is a while ago, he was going around giving a lecture. And he was giving a talk, and we went, and it was in a very small place, because, you know, not many Americans really care if the former Prime Minister of Canada is going to talk, sadly, right? Because he's a really smart guy, and I was interested to hear what he had to say. And people were asking him about his time as Prime Minister, and when he was opposition leader. And he said the most stunning thing, he said, oh, it's always easier to be leader of the opposition than Prime Minister. And my partner and I went, that's not our experience. <laughs> That's not our experience at all, right? It's actually quite difficult to be opposition, right? But in his experience, he enjoyed that more. I guess it just came naturally. He's like, you can just say, no, it's not enough, it's not good, da da da. But I'd say that's a simplistic model of doing opposition. It requires a lot of work, and it requires work in the prep prep stage, which is your prep time for your prep time. How much prep time for your prep time do you get? Infinite. Your lifetime. As my, yeah, your lifetime. Infinite. Well, maybe not infinite. I don't know. You have to take very good care of yourself approaching that, right? But uh, definitely as much time as you'd like to use. So here are some things that you need to do during your prep for your prep time. Right? The first is to establish generic positions. Right? What do I mean by generic positions? Well, there are certain words that we know will, are likely to appear in motions, right? What words are you, do you really expect that you'll probably see in the motions? That will most of none, three, two times out of three, you'll see them. Believes. Believes, right? What else? Will. Hmm? Will or has to. Yeah, has to. Should. Will, yeah, should. Justify. Justify, now we're getting into it. Justify. Now these are special cases, right? Because we'll talk about these in a minute, because these mean something for what the government's obligations are, right? The leaves has to will. Those mean something for the government obligation. But things that I'm talking about now for generic positions are things like justify. What other words like this appear in motions frequently? Better. Okay. Let me give you one. How about ban? Mm -hmm. right. How about legalize? Right. I have sort of a list. I can read them to you so I don't run out of the chalkboard here. <laughs> they will allow, condemn, permit. Right. All of these sorts of words that imply an action. Right. There's some kind of action. Right. And the thing you need to do in your prep, prep time is to establish differences between what it means to condemn and what it means to ban. Right? What that would entail. What would that have in it? And the reason you do this is because what you would want to do, let's, let's just for an example, let's take ban for an example. What does it mean to ban? Prohibit. Prohibit. Why would you not want to prohibit something in extremely general terms? People need access to. People might need access to it. It's bad to keep people from something they need access to. Like harmful consequences. Maybe. Harmful consequences of banning it? Banning. Yeah, like specifically? Mm -hmm. Can you be more specific on our very general? <laughs> Forbidden fruit effect. Forbidden fruit effect. Now what's that? It's like, you, like the prohibition. You say you, don't have, you, you may not do something and people start doing it. Yeah. If you say you can't do that, then people will do it in a much, much more dangerous way. Mm -hmm. Example. Drinking restrictions in the United States. Right? right now, when teenagers get a hold of alcohol, like in Europe, they might not make good judgments, but they certainly don't do the kinds of things that American teenagers do. Right? Like get incredibly unhealthily drunk 
on really cheap alcohol. Right? <clears throat> Forbidden fruit syndrome, right? Or like banning drugs, right? And so these are the things you need to brainstorm. You need to think of these terms that appear frequently and then come up with why those things would be bad in general, right? We would not want to ban because we might create black markets, right? What about something like legalize something? That's a little bit harder. In general terms, why would it be bad to legalize? Because, because you increase the incidence of that unlegal thing in, in the community, and if it's, on, I mean, if it's not legal, it's because it's supposed that you must, it, you're better when the incidence is lower. Yeah, so there's a sort of an endorsement, right? Yeah. yeah. And it's, there's some bad reason why it was illegal. And you're going to increase the presence of that illegal thing by legalizing. That's a very good general framework. We're just sort of making like foundational arguments here. And you want to sort of plan these out and write these out and commit them to memory with your partner. So that if you get one of these things, you can very quickly construct an argument on this skeleton. Because right? you already know the general reasons why the thing would be bad. Right? Now on ones that say better, or to justify, how would you do that? Those are a little bit harder because they do more value. Yes. Uh, it's like something is better than something, mm -hmm. and like like x is better than z, and you should say that z is better than x. Yeah, you could very easily just do the opposite, right? That's sort of a very basic strategy. But since we have our infinite prep time, let's think of something a little bit more complicated. Of saying why better might be bad to say. It's bad to call things better. It's, it's kind of weird, huh? I, I have this, like, I don't understand what better in this context means. Like, usually in a sentence, please. Now, better would mean uh, it is better to own a dog than a cat. Oh. Okay. Pre preferable. Okay. Right? It's really sub subjective. So it's maybe. subjective. Very good. Now, what is wrong with being subjective? Because I, I can have you different can't opinions prove, than you, and it, it both could be, like, right. Mm -hmm. it's, bad to, it's bad to concede to subjective things because they might not be good for me. Like apples might be better than oranges unless I'm allergic to apples, right? What are you saying? It can't be proved. Yeah. And it can't be proved. Can't apply it to large scale. Yeah. Can't apply it to large scale things, right? Yeah. It's always situational. So it's bad to call things better because it sort of flattens important differences between people. That might be something I would jot down in my little notebook. And then in prep, you can look at this thing and have all the structure for different arguments ready to go. Other terms that appear in motions that aren't like this, believes, has to, will, should, we'll deal with those in a bit, but then there's some other ones that appear, such as in this case, have you ever seen a motion with that? This house believes that in this case, terrorism is justified. Something like that. Or motions that say, this house would support intervention in the Middle East. Right? So we need to know these terms, Middle East, support, right? or this house believes that democracy, that we should promote democracy through the world, or something like that. Right? We need to know these terms, like democracy, things like the state, right? which come up in debates all the time. They may not be in the motion, they might come up in speeches. Right? And we need to do the exact same thing and come up with skeletons as to why those things are bad. Right? What's wrong with democracy? It can be um, like identified the different things, beginning from <coughs> preserving human rights and ending with uh, like uh, open elections or something. Mm -hmm. Opens open the door for populism. Populism? What's wrong with populism? Well, the wouldn't that be great? Uh, no, the, 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 the policies that end up being approved are the, mo the most popular ones rather than the better ones. Right, very good. Now that's a discriminating impact, right? Do you see that gives something for a judge to really hold on to? The popular ones will be preferred over the more the better policies. Now that's a good line that will distinguish your team, right? Through the debate. Right? And now of course it needs meat on it. But we have the skeleton there, and you put the specifics of the debate around it. That's the same mechanism. Why else might democracy be bad? Suppressing it suppresses minorities because uh, it's ma it's majority. majority. Yeah, the simple understanding of democracy, right, would be it suppresses minority rights, right? which is one of the concerns of democracy. Or uh, the best ideas don't get forwarded, like Jose says. 
right? Or maybe the people uh, shouldn't govern their own affairs, right? And you need to come up with impacts to why democracy might be bad, right? In this case, it might be the same thing as better, right? We might want to say, well, one case is not enough, right? And we might say, what are some reasons why we might say the state is bad? They might say it's good to have a nation state, right? This last debate. It's good to have a nation state. Now, you need to have some generic arguments against the nation state that you can always draw on because it will come up frequently. Okay, let's move along. <clears throat> there are some other words that are a little bit more complicated because you don't necessarily want to just come up with reasons why they are bad because these words might be things that you would want to support as opposition, right? And it's important to do this as a sort of exercise to get your mind working in an opposition way, right? And this would be trying to do defenses of the things both ways. Certain words like torture, right? It's easy to argue that torture is bad. Can you argue that torture is good? Yeah. How? Well, in, in, you know, state issues that can save millions and millions of life, well, maybe we could violate the rights of one. Mm -hmm. Right, so here's a comparative argument. If we save a bunch of lives, we could violate the rights of one person. Remember, Mr. Speaker, torture is not killing. Remember that. Right? It's just a viol temporary violation of rights to save millions of lives. Right? That's how it could be good. What about war? You know, it's easy to say war is bad. How can we say war is good? Sometimes it's the only way to solve the conflict. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's the only way to solve the conflict. It would be better to have the war than have the conflict going on forever. Right? Depending on how we define conflict. Other things. Anyone else want to stab at it? I can give you another word. How about um, terrorism? That's fighting for freedom. Yeah. Cool. There's a, so yeah. <laughs> there's a phrase, there's an idiom we have in English. It's uh, one person's terrorist is another one's freedom fighter. Depends on where you stand, right? So, uh, and a strategy of regimes is to call the rebels terrorists, right? To make the popular opinion go against them, right? What about um, sanctions? That's one that comes up in debates all the time as a model, right? Government teams often want to sanction people. I don't know what's wrong with the government, but see, we're all pro-opposition in here, so we make fun of them. Um, <laughs> but, uh, they always want to sanction. What what could uh, could we do that both ways? Bad about sanctions and then good about sanctions. Oh, they're usually inefficient. They're usually inefficient. If we're talking about economic sanctions. Yeah, right. We can talk about economic sanctions. Yeah. Yeah. They're inefficient. Now, what's bad with something being inefficient? Well, it, it firstly just uh, angers the population that suffers the sanction, mm -hmm. and uh, well, it also hurts them, and it makes the and it makes the leaders have a powerful tool for them to look. I don't know what country that is sanctioned, that's that something we get. Um, this country, we should fight them. Like right, so right, right. Use as a tool. Right, it's used as a tool to make the country look bad, is that what you're saying? Or no, no, no. Get sympathy? Yes, I mean, yeah. the country that sanctions right. looks bad. Right, right, right. Country that sanctions looks bad, and then the country that's being sanctioned sometimes gets sympathy from the international community. A uh, case in point on this is the sanctions that the United States had on Iraq for a number of years after the first Gulf War. Uh, President Clinton continued those sanctions, and they were sanctioning even things like medical supplies and things to clean water. And the argument was there were like half a million Iraqi children dying because of these sanctions. And Madeleine Albright, who was the Secretary of State, went on 60 Minutes, which is a news program that's very popular in the US. And um, they asked her about this. They said, do you think that these sanctions are worth half a million Iraqi children dying? And she said, I think that's collateral damage. Really? Yeah, she, she was the Secretary of State. Secretary of State. Clinton's Secretary of State. She's very tender. Yeah, she's a very tender. When you, if you ever see her on television, you'll see that she's a very tender hearted woman. She doesn't look very cold and calculating at all. She doesn't look like cool. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a little harsh. I don't know if we need to, I'm sure someone loves her. <laughs> Not the Iraqis, eh? It was like, this is collateral damage, right? Now, that's not the best way of saying sanctions are good. <laughs> That'd be an example of what not to do. This is why you need to prepare, because you don't want to be Madeleine Albright. <laughs> well, for a number of reasons, but you don't want to be here because of a response to this argument. You have to prepare ahead for that. You know, people, I watched a, a sanctions, well, actually, I participated. It was more like watching, but I did watch one, uh, where no one made this argument, but I think it's one of the better ones, is to say that 
the sanctions only affect the population, they don't affect yes. the regime, because Saddam was able to make money mm -hmm. at the same time the people were all suffering from the sanctions. So, mm -hmm. you know, easily circumvented by the regime. Right. Saddam Hussein was living in the lap of luxury, and his sons too, while the people were suffering from lack of medical supplies, clean water, basic human necessities. Right? So one of the ways sanctions, like if the government doesn't specify what kind of sanctions, you could very easily and very quickly come up with reasons about all kinds of sanctions why they're bad. Say, so look, you know, Madam Speaker, they don't even tell you whether medical supplies and food supplies are covered with the sanction. We can't endorse a policy that might hurt children and hurt the general population of this country because that is just not right. That is, you would not want to assent to that kind of a moral uh, position. Right? And that's how this works in your benefit. Okay, so those are what we call the broad terms. Now, here's another thing you need to do. You need to come up with indictments of, of the following organizations, right? Because these are things that people might use as their models. Okay? So here's a list. You need to come up with, with your partner, three reasons why each of these organizations would be bad. The WTO, the United Nations, here's an easy one, the United States. <laughs> The European Union, NATO, the G8, the G20, ASEAN, A-S-E-A-N. You know ASEAN? Yeah. yeah. The World Bank, the ICC. Those are probably the most specific ones I could come up with, but there will be others that when you debate, you will need to figure out who they are and be able to come up with your partner and sort of memorize three quick, easy reasons why this organization is bad. Sorry, uh, you said uh, after G20, yeah. which came? ASEAN, A-S-E-A-N. Do you know that one? It's the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. They're sort of like, you know how, and, oh, another one, NAFTA, which might not be one you don't know, is the North American Free Trade Agreement, yeah. which is Canada, the United States, and Mexico. We have a free trade zone between each other to where we don't tariff each other's goods across the border. The borders are relatively open for goods, right? And we used to tax each other's stuff pretty heavily. Right? But now all three of us are in agreement that we're not going to do that. And ASEAN is the same thing. It's like the Southeast Asian nations all together. So well, NAFTA is the uh, U.S., Canada, and... In Mexico. Mexico. Mm -hmm. and it's called N-A-F-T-A, NAFTA. And that's how the European Union started at the beginning. Exactly. It was the same right. like, like mm -hmm. tariffs and border thing. Right. Yeah. And then the WTO is attempting to do this globally. Right? It would be one way of characterizing the WTO. The WTO is not about uh, trade. Trade, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, well, I mean, of course, the United States and Mexico agree heavily on immigration policy. Right? That's a big, huge sticking point that sometimes uh, Mexico gets very upset with us and sometimes we get very upset with them right? about, about immigration. Uh, and then other generic sorts of things like the media. Because like sometimes people might be like, well, you know, the media will, will, will give the message out. The media will let people know this is bad. And you could be like, this is a terrible thing. Right? Like um, you might have a motion like um, about embedded journalists. Right? Some of you may have had that as a practice. Like if you were in Baraka's uh, lecture the last couple of days, we used that motion a couple of times. Uh, embedded journalists, some people are making arguments about the media's role in journalists' role. And, and you want to keep this list open because the more of these generic things you hear, the more you want to think of things against them as you go. So keep that one with three reasons for each one you want to um, come up with, okay? Now, this one's a little more complicated. Another thing you have to do for your strategy is you need to come up with what do certain things cause that might not be intended by the government? What are some causes of things? So, one of your jobs as opposition is to generate new material, right? We've all talked about how it's hard for extensions and things like that. Here's one way to do it. If the government is talking about improving economic conditions, you want to, maybe you can have an extension of what comes along with that, right? Like, you know, governments are told to argue consequences of what they do, right? These are good consequences. You want to take that same reasoning and say, what are some of the unexpected consequences of the government's plan? Right? And this goes along with everything that we've done so far. So if they say, we improve our economic strength of the EU, you can say, well, what kind of bad things come along with that improved economic strength? Right? If they say, we 
increase and, and restrict the law around this issue. We make the law more restrictive. You could talk about what is bad about restricting, making more restricting laws. So it's sort of like, what are the other things that happen? Because government wants you to see it like this, and I'm going to write up here for convenience, that whatever it is that they do is just going to cause their good thing. Their good thing being Y, their model being X. But in reality, as we know, anytime I even move through the room, right? if I say, I'm going to pick up this cup, right? just like this, what else have I also done? Hmm? I, I put it down. Yeah, that's good. Well, like picking up the cup, what other things that I, well, I had to move, right? I moved air particles around. Who knows what other things I could do? If there's a chair in the way, I could easily knock that over. I'm not even think that that would cause any problem. But it's up to you as the opposition to point out, well, this is a cause that you can't get by, right? There's no way around it. This is also going to happen, and it's going to be bad, and it's going to be worse than what it is that they are proposing. Does that make sense to everyone? Because when they do something, they're doing a lot of things at once. Like if you improve the strength, right, of the European Union, there are a lot of other reasons. There are some reasons why that might not be a good idea, right? It could anger some other people. Right? It could also make the European Union emboldened to do certain things that they probably shouldn't be doing, right? These kind of things. Okay. Side effects. Side effects. That's a good way of talking about it, right? It would be like they're saying, Judge, we're going to take, or Mr. Speaker, we're going to take this pill. And then you point out the side effects on the bottle. Well, you know, this could cause dizziness. You know, we wouldn't want to drive a car. This could hurt your liver, whatever. Okay. So these are the things that you need to do in your uh, pre, or your prep prep, is what I was calling it, right? Your prep prep. Okay. So what do we do when we are prepping? What are the things we need to do to be strategic? Well, all these things that we've done, all these little things, commit as many to memory as you can, but also bring them with you to the tournament, this little list. Because you never know, you might want to access this and, and create a nice prep sheet, right? a piece of paper with all of your ideas that you bring into the debate with you. And you can draw from this bank of stuff all these different things that you could do as opposition. So you get the motion. What is the first thing you should do when you are opposition, when you get the motion, what what do you usually do? Analyze. Hmm? Analyze. Analyze. Well, what do you mean by that? Uh, like see whether it is semi-closed or closed. Mm -hmm. If it is closed, it's just like beginning founding arguments against. If it is semi-closed, thinking how possibly the government would interpret it. Right. Okay. So if it's closed or semi-closed, that's a good thing to identify. And could they do multiple things, or is there just one thing that they could do? Right? Like the motion for this afternoon's debate. Right? What would, how would you characterize that one? Closed. Closed? Yeah. Pretty closed? Okay. Well, it's closed, but in that one you could also have multiple things that they could do. Right? There's many different ways of doing it. So it's kind of difficult to um, narrow it down. Right? It's one of these motions that's kind of, it might be semi-closed, I don't know. Because there's a number of different ways the government can do it. But um, what uh, are, there, are there any other things people do when they analyze a motion? Or the very first thing you do when you get a motion? Identify the problem, right? So hmm? Identify the problem, that would be the first thing. Yeah, identify the problem that the government is likely going to solve or talk about, right? Is that what you mean? Yes. Okay. So it's kind of backwards. You want to think about what the government is going to do first. Here's my suggestion, right? And this works for open or closed or semi-closed motions. Is Look for key words that identify the obligations of the government team. Every motion, since it's a point of debate, will have certain things the government teams will have to do. You identify those obligations, I think that you will be in much better shape for uh, constructing a strategy. Just like Alexander said, the problem, right? This comes from finding these obligations, right? If you look at the wording of the motion, they have to support an independent Kurdish state. That means it has to be independent. It can't be a, a state inside another state. It has to be supported. That means, what does support mean? Well, you can go and look at some of your words that you've done previous work on, because you've done your prep prep, and say, OK, here's what we think about support and why that might be bad. So they have to support. They have to boost up, create, uh, start creating one of these states. So you want to identify those obligations. It's legitimate to take what you've done in prep prep 
like let's say a workbook and take it to the home session? I think so. Yeah. I don't think there's any rule against that. But you can look at uh, pretty much whatever you'd like yeah. in a prep session. Okay. Uh, it's in the realm where tournaments disagree what you can use. Some tournaments have different rules, but they're really quite pretty loose, I think. But you want you, you want to bring that with you and use it sort of as a resource. Right? You don't like want to take your uh, prep prep stuff into the round because it'll just sort of overwhelm and confuse you. You want to do all this stuff in your prep time stuff, I think. And then some of the more important ones you can commit to memory that you use a lot. If you find a lot of people you're debating are using the UN a lot, well then you better memorize the reasons why the UN is bad and be able to talk about that just off the top of your head. Okay. Okay. After you've identified these obligations, you'll know better what the problem is and what the solutions might be. Okay. So after you have that brainstormed, then you need to think about, okay, out of all these things the government could do, what are the things that link best to the motion? That are the best support for the motion? Because that's going to help you understand and get better, uh, a more accurate shot at what the government's actually going to do. So you might have two. Right? You might have three. I don't know if I would do more than that. If it's open, it might not help you to maybe have ten or so, but as many as you can if it's an open motion. Right? It's very difficult to do an open motion, but semi-closed, or what in the U.S. we call that a jar. Right? Not like a jar, but a jar like a door being a jar. Like halfway uh, closed or halfway open, depending on whether you're a positive person. Um, <laughs> so, in a jar motion, uh, is easier, and then close the course, it's pretty easy to find out what arguments will link. Then, after you decide that, you decide what you think three of your best arguments against that will be from the things that you've previously prepped. Right? So you're like, okay, what are my three, because you're not really generating refutation right now, you're generating independent matter. So three is a pretty good reason, but you might want to come up with maybe five. And if you're second opposition, you want to come up with as many as you possibly can. <laughs> this is very important for second opposition because we all know how difficult it is to come up with an extension for second opposition. It's very tough because you might feel a little overwhelmed by what's going on in the rest of the debate. Right, so if you're first opposition, come up with what you think are the best arguments. Maybe five or so might be pretty good because you want to have things to fall back on if they don't do exactly what you think. And then try to do that. You might want to make this time in your prep time, time where you work apart. You can say, okay, I know more about this possible thing the government could do. You know more about that one. Let's split up for two or three minutes and just write and prepare that. Okay, then we'll come back together to do the next thing at the end of that. So you don't always have to be working together. Right? As you get to know your partner, it will be easier to, to do that. But you don't always have to be working together. You work together, come on and say, okay, I'll take this and this, you take that, and shh, come up with it all. Right? Okay, the next thing you need to do, after you've decided which way you're going to approach, you need to think of what they would call a principle, right, or what I call a sort of a packaging, or a framing, for those arguments of how you're going to sell that as your team's position. If you're second opposition, this is going to take some work, right, because you have a number of different arguments, but you want to pick the ones you think go together that you're going to run against that um, government team's argument, and then say, okay, here's what you're supporting. So if you have an argument that talks about why uh, sanctions are a bad idea, why the United Nations is a bad organization, right? and why um, uh, something else like we would never want to, um, oh, I don't know. well, let's say those are your two arguments. Right? You could characterize it in sort of a general phrase over it that sort of identifies the thesis or the main idea of your position as the opposition. What is that main idea and how can you state it? You say, our position is that international actions right, ought to be rejected. They're not very good because there's not a very good mechanism for these things. And we'll also see that sanctions are really terrible. So you want to present a package deal. Like, here's what you get. You think of it like sales, right? Like selling something. Now, here is what you get. Right? You get all these great features right, for this one thing. So you want it to have a nice theme because... If you just do your own independent stuff and then a bunch of refutation, you're not really going to distinguish yourself from some of the other teams in the domain. Okay. Then if you have time left, you might want to plot out a couple of points that you might want to ask. You might just want to think of a couple of points just so that you know that you'll have something to stand up and talk about, some generic ones. Okay, so 
That's your prep time sort of strategy, the way I would map it out and try it. And of course, everyone's going to adapt that to their own needs and the own th their own things that they might want to, to do. Okay, so what do you do during the debate? What do you do during the debate? You're hearing the government talk. Yeah. I choose uh, which part of their case is better to oppose. Okay. Like in Ukraine, we have four strategies to oppose. Mm -hmm. Like uh, to um, like to propose status quo to mm -hmm. show that it is better, then to show the harmful harmful consequences. Yes. Or to go in destructive way just to like crush all their arguments, mm -hmm. or to try to oppose the model. Mm -hmm. And the other one, it is not very like, spread. It's like showing that there is no direct logical link between the motion and their position, or mm -hmm. just to show that the, there is no problem, or if it is a problem, their plan doesn't solve the problem. All right, okay. This is a good list of things the opposition can do, right? And it's pretty, um, pretty long, right? And it's good to have that kind of memorized, right? But I think that um, you have this nice list you've prepared of different things. The very first thing you do when you're listening, right, is you listen, you think, okay, which is best here? But one of the things you might want to do first is scratch out the things that don't apply. And this is like the hardest thing to do because you might have an awesome argument, right? A really awesome argument that you really love. You've worked on it in prep time. It's so incredibly good, but it doesn't really link to what they're doing. Maybe you could figure out a way to make it kind of fit. No, no right? Go with the things that you have that are much more direct in reputation. Right? It's kind of hard because it's like you've drawn this really nice, pretty, you know, picture. Right? You've drawn this really nice thing. It's like so lovely. Right? This lovely like flower. Right? And it's just so cute. And you're like, man, I can't wait to talk about the flower. Right? But then they're talking about something not like outer space. Right? You can't. You know, flowers in outer space don't have a lot in common, right? So you can't really run your flower argument because it doesn't really link to outer space, right? So you have to take this happy, cute thing and just, you're done, right? I can't think about you anymore. It's a very difficult thing to do. But a lot of times, I know it's very sad, right? But uh, a lot of times, that's a big mistake we make, is we think of a great opposition argument, but then it doesn't have anything to do with the, the thing that they're doing. So you want to scratch those out because you don't want to be tempted by them. And then take your biggest ones, the ones that have the big impact, and really sort of spend your time while they're talking, fleshing out that bad result, the consequences of the plan, that terrible thing that's happening. Right? And then um, think of a couple of the other arguments you're going to use against it. And say, okay, now we know what we're doing. Right? That's sort of for first opposition. And then the second opposition, we sometimes forget something, right? That you can actually use points of information to actually ask a question. Right? and not just sound smart, right? You can actually use them to clarify what's going on. And I think sometimes we forget that because we always think of points of information as like that moment where, you know, somebody really gets somebody, right? Oh, man, they just really tore that argument up. Oh, yeah, like a really nice statement. But you can actually use them to clarify things, right? Well, would the government defend that blah, 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 blah? That helps you narrow your arguments down if they take you. Right? And if you ask a question like that that gives them something more to talk about, they'll probably call on you again, right? Because you didn't like devastatingly smash their <laughs> case over your leg, you know. You know. Right? They'll probably call on you again. So you can get more clarification, more understanding of what it is that they're doing. Now, second opposition. You have a long way to go before you talk, right? So you have to do two things. You have to eliminate. Hey, Hi. you can come in if you want. No, I'm oh, I think he's with uh, Iridium. Right. So, what you need to do is you have this long list of different second, second opposition arguments, much longer than your first opposition list. Right? What you need to do is you need to, first of all, scratch out the things that aren't going to link to what the government did. And then, when you hear opposition, scratch out the things that would backstab or the things that they've already sent. Right? Now, what if you're sort of left with nothing? Right? What if they've taken all the good matter in the first opposition? What do you do? Well, you have a little time to plan a couple of different things that are sort of quick. If your prep didn't go the way you thought in the second opposition, and you need to um, figure out what that extension is, well, there are two things that you can do that I think are good things to sort of practice, keep in mind. You can go with what's called um, a tangential argument. 
Neutral? Tangential, like a tangent. Yeah. Or you can go for depth. Yeah. Two ways of sort of generating arguments very quickly. Tangential. Okay. Here's what the opposition has said that they are that they are doing to oppose. Is there something that is sort of related to that but goes in a different direction? So we all know that we can generate arguments through looking at if they go economic, we can go social. If they go uh, material, like reality, we can go philosophical. If they go politics, we can go culture. Right? All these oppositions are nice because they're not really oppositions; they're things that complement each other. Right? Because we could say politics affects culture, and culture affects politics. Right? So there are all these little sort of oppositional terms that you can sort of research and um, sort of be able to think in these terms very quickly. So they might be doing something, and a tangential, it's called tangential argument because I just sort of thought of it as a way of sort of generating some different um, uh, arguments on the fly. So if they're arguing the political effects right, of giving a state to the Kurds would be bad. It's gonna be terrible, it's gonna ruin uh, Iran and uh, Turkey are going to freak out. It's going to totally eliminate the American ability to control Iraq. Iraq is going to destabilize. It's going to be an awful thing. Now that seems like a pretty big argument. Right? If we think tangentially, what can we add to that as an extension? Right? If we just think about tangential arguments, things that are related but go in a different direction. Does anybody have any idea? Yeah. No? Okay. Well, let's think about this. If they're talking about war and geopolitics and international relations, something closely connected to that would be sort of the cultural effects of doing this. So your extension might be, this is a, a wonderful reason to oppose this terrible war and the destabilization of the regional politics. But what I want to speak about today, Madam Speaker, is the cultural effects of doing such a thing to Kurds all over the world. They'll be seen as the instigators of this sort of a war and these problems. And it will make their own governments and those countries clamp down on them harder, oppress them more, and no one will be sympathetic to them. That's sort of an example of sort of how to do it. Right? So if they say political, you might think cultural. If they say philosophical, you might think more re reality. What? No. Yeah, no, it's fine. You can... Oh, it's just okay. I mean, oh, okay, cool. So that's one. And then depth would be the other one. Depth would be... If they talk about sanctions, and they're arguing sanctions are a, much, a really good way of dealing with things, and they don't really specify, you can talk about the good things, through examples, that sanctions bring. Right? You can do that as sort of an extension. Now, you have to be very careful here. Because if they talk about, oh, sanctions are awful, da 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 right? and then you want to talk about some particular type of sanctions as being really, really bad, you want to make sure that matches up with the debate that's been going on in the first table. Because right? if the second government, the first uh, government, second speaker clarifies what kind of sanctions it is, well then, some of your examples might not work. But you can always go much deeper than, than they've gone. Okay? Now, a couple of quick things before we end on the whip speech, which is probably the most, one of the most difficult speeches. Here are three things that I want you to sort of write down and use as a guideline for making strategic whip speeches. First, you, during the debate, have the nasty job, and you have enough lists now, right, from what I've told you. You have to make another list. And this is a list that you should make and check twice. I mean, it's close enough to Christmas to sort of make a list and check it twice, right? Check it a few times, because what you want to make sure is this is a list of the greatest hits of the debate. Right? If people are talking about an argument on the first tables and everyone mentions it, it's got to be in your speech. Right? It has to come into your analysis. The most popular arguments have to come into your analysis, the ones that everyone talks about. Not your favorite one <laughs> that Prime Minister brought up and no one else mentioned. And you're like, ooh, I've got something against that. Ooh. Because if you're the whip, well, that's not role fulfillment. Right? <laughs> that's just not role fulfillment. Right? It has to be something everyone, if everyone's discussed it, discussed it. Uh, nice slip. <laughs> if everyone has dis discussed it, right? Then, <laughs> discussed it, I have to enunciate. Then, it has to be in your speech, whether you like the argument or not. You have to deal with it in some way. So this list will generate everything you have to talk about. Yeah. But what if you don't have the answer to the argument? It's really, it's, it was really discussed, but you don't have any answer. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Okay, yeah. All right. Now, 
You might not have the answer to this argument, right? You don't know what to say. But that's what the purpose, that can also help you generate an extension too. As you're listening, you say, hey, this argument's really popular. Let's think of an extension that deals with this. Because then you'll look like the big hero. Because you say, opposition handled this argument great, da, da, da. but this extension will really clarify what our position here is in the opposition today. It'll really clarify and take care of some of these concerns. So that can help you generate what a good extension might be. It can help you out with whether you should go to the side or in, in deeper in to what's already been said. Right? So that's one way of dealing with it. Now if you guys really, really can't figure out the argument, well then you need to just sort of figure out a way of what opposition has already said, right? has dealt with it. But you don't want to spend too much time on that. So this helps you plan out your time management. Because you don't want to give too much time strategically to first opposition's argument. They've had their chance to impress the judge, right? They've had their chance to make the argument. Don't rely too much on what they've said. The second thing is remember the package deal that we talked about at the beginning. Remember that. This is where this comes into play. Right? This is where you offer the round to the judge as a package. If you decide opposition today, Mr. Speaker, here are the list of prizes you get. Not like a game show. Right? Or you can do it in a sad way. If you give the government the round today, let's talk about the horrible and depressing world that we'll live in. This is the thing that makes you very memorable. Remember the judge has been listening and listening to a lot of speeches. You're the very last one. You can't just follow what everyone else has done. You have to make it fresh and new right, so that the judge will pay more attention to you. Because I think most critics are probably biased against you because they will think, well, they just spoke. That's fresh in my mind. I don't want to be unbiased to the other speakers. Right? So they're going to discount what you say anyway a little bit because you're the most recent speaker they've heard. And they'll say, was that argument really that good or is it just that my memory is more fresh there than these speakers I heard, you know, 30 minutes ago. So offer the package deal, and then when you think about how you framed the whole thing, then you know what order and how to characterize all the matter that you're concerned about not being able to answer. You can characterize it in there, put it in there, and say, this is an example of why you would never want to violate this idea, okay? because you get nasty things. And finally, this is a good one to remember, your analysis of the debate must be fair. <laughs> it's a kind of a loaded one. It must be fair. That doesn't mean it must be nice. Right? It has to be fair, right? Remember, everyone else who has spoken before you has had their chance to make the best argument they can. Don't give them any leeway on what they said. Hold them to what they said. This is very strategic. Right? Because if they haven't developed it enough, don't assume that the critic, that the speaker, understands exactly what they meant. Use their words as if they're meant literally. So like in this debate earlier that I judged that Alexandra was in, right, we talked a lot about instability. It would be nice as a whip to be like, now they're saying that if we do this, it's going to cause instability. Okay. Show me a country that's not in unstable at some point, and they've turned out fine. Right? Let's talk about the United States. How many periods of instability has it had? And it's turned out, well, reasonably okay. Maybe if we get a new government. It'll be better. But uh, let's talk about instability. How is that bad in itself? That's an opportunity for change. But even if you think instability is bad, Mr. Speaker, look at how much better giving a Kurdish state is. Reason, reason, reason. These are the things that my partner tells you in the extension. Right? These, this is how these arguments are solved. First government said this, and the response was this, and then the extension sort of clarifies it. They've done a fine job, but this is the argument that really is most important. So be fair. Don't be sort of concessional to, to them. So those are my tips for making good whip speeches. The whip is the most difficult, or one of the most difficult, I think, because of this idea that you can't really say all those things you wanted to say the whole debate. Being strategic is you have to kind of get rid of yourself. Right? It's like even though you might have the best thing in the world to say about this third point the Prime Minister made 45 minutes ago, you got to give it up. You can tell your friends later. But you can't say it in the debate. You have to sort of serve the debate. Okay. Are there any questions or comments or anything else? Yeah. Question about changing the definition. Okay. Uh, we may change it only when the definition of government is absolutely bad. Or we can say like it is bad, but we will play because we are clever. It's much better to do the second. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say that with I don't understand what you mean by absolutely bad, right? Like uh, undebatable is yeah. the best way to think about it. It's absolutely undebatable. Now, how many things are absolutely undebatable? Truism. Can you give me a specific thing that would be undebatable? Uh, 
president has to put right, uh, uh, like his right uh, to put veto because he has a right to put veto. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that is a truism. The president has the right of veto. That's our argument today, right? Now that seems like a truism, right? And it's sort of a bad argument. But instead of saying <coughs> these definitions are undebatable, right? You still might not, it might not be the best thing, because you might not really understand what they're saying. They're not explicitly probably going to say that. It might be better to say, we think that this is a very, very strange definition. We think this definition is kind of true. However, we're still going to try to debate it. Right? So you kind of try to do both. It's a very, very, very rare case where you will actually win a redefinition, I think, is my understanding. It's very rare to hear one, right? Now, um, the strategy, thinking strategically, um, all of your prep and everything is kind of useless if they define something so tight. But you can certainly sort of say, well, here's the, what they're sort of, I think, saying is that presidents should always execute the powers that they are given. That seems to be what they're saying, and I'm good. we're going to argue why that's not a good idea. That presidents should use discretion listening to the people. Here are three reasons why that's important. The president serves the people, and he works on a mandate based on the election. Secondly, all the powers of the president are not meant to be used all the time. Some of them are just for extreme cases. They haven't met the burden of proving an extreme case yet to show a president must use a veto. And finally, da -da -da -da, or something like that. I think you'll get a lot of credit from the judge for the fact that you've tried to make something horrible good, rather than making something horrible and just saying it's horrible. Right? I don't think that's as, um, that demonstrates the things that you're able to do better. Right? And given the culture plan, it, it's, it's not very good to give it. It's not, but um, sometimes it might be. That's something that's, that's uh, a little bit more advanced than advanced. Right? Uh, counter plan is sort of like a, the way to think about it is like a bad result of their model. It's sort of attacking the model is the way to think about it. So what you want to say is their model is bad because it stops a better solution from happening. Right? Now that's the way to think about that. Do you understand this economic concept of opportunity cost? What is opportunity cost? Um, the opportunity you practically lose the moment you choose something. Yeah. When you make a choice and you put resources to that choice, there's something else you could have done with those resources that might be better. That's the way to think of a counter plan. So sometimes they might be good to offer, but you don't ever want to think of them as my model versus theirs on a one-to-one. -one. It's not that at all. It's their model is bad because it forecloses the opportunity to do this better model. But you can just say that the, their model is better than the model without proposing our country plan. Say it again, I'm sorry. Uh, we just can say that their model is bad. Mm -hmm. Like it, ha it doesn't like, it is deprives them, them of opportunity, but we don't give uh, an alternative. Not, not in the way that you would if you were first proposition. You would say their model is bad because it denies the opportunity for this action. Right? For example, let's say that we would have um, the United States offer aid to some country and stability to some country and say, this is a bad model because, first of all, the United States is very flawed, da, 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 but it also precludes this opportunity to have the United Nations do it. And you have to show how that's an opportunity cost. So you take care of all the issues of a counterplan at once. You take care of why it's advantageous, right, which is important for a counterplan, why this other model is better. Well, it's better because it would actually work when your refutation shows there's won't. Secondly, it has to be mutually exclusive. It shows that too. It shows that too. Hi. Is it time to time for the motion? Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.